the title of this lecture, Why Philosophy is More Pleasurable Than Sex. Very amusing, I know. Or alternately for my shirt, Knowledge is King. This will be an explanation of a great little work, one of my favorite philosophers, subject of my doctoral dissertation, John Stuart Mill. The book is called Utilitarianism, massively thick work, as you can see. Of course, I didn't require my busy students to read all of this, just a little bit less than half. Utilitarianism has as a root the word utility. Utility means useful. This will be useful. Nice to have something in a modern education that's useful. He begins by telling us we are looking for the highest good in life. And what is the same thing he tells us? The foundation of morality. After all, morality is about what's good. So if something is the highest good, that would be the most important thing in morality, the foundation of morality. So by the time I'm done, about 45 minutes, you will know what is the highest good in life. Worthy subject of discussion for a little bit less than an hour in philosophy class. But he begins by telling us, if I am going to try to prove that something is the highest good, give a proof in ethics, what ethics is about, proving what's good as opposed to what's bad or wrong or evil. Mill cautions us a proof in ethics is not the same as a proof in physics, which is not the same as a proof in mathematics, which is not the same as a proof in biology. All these different areas have a different kind of proof. If I want to give a proof in physics, I can give a direct proof where everybody sees and everyone agrees. If, for example, I want to prove one of the basic principles of physics, say I want to prove the law of gravity, I take an object, the pen will do, I hold it, and what I claim is a gravitational field, now I release it, see it falls to the floor beneath. Now you have all seen my demonstration, you all agree with my conclusion, you all believe in the law of gravity. And if anybody put up their hand and said, oh no, Steve, I saw your demonstration, you said, look, so I did, but I don't agree with your conclusion, I don't believe in the law of gravity, I could show that you were merely being a difficult student this morning, maybe had a fight with one of your significant others, take you up to the roof and ask if you want me to push you off. Then we'll see if you don't really believe that your body has weight, and if left unsupported in this gravitational field, you will go splat against the concrete and die. So everyone believes in the law of gravity. Anyone who does not believe in the law of gravity fell and died a long time ago already, and they are no longer around to disagree. But there is nothing comparable in ethics. I can't give a direct proof where everyone agrees. There's no such thing as unanimous agreement about what's right and wrong. There is disagreement, and there's no such thing as direct proof, only indirect proof. I prove that something is good by showing that it gets you something else. For example, medicine is good. Why? Medicine makes you healthy. But now I have to prove that health is good. How am I going to do that? I can't prove it like I prove the law of gravity, and not everybody even wants to be healthy. Some people, hypochondriacs, seem to prefer at least thinking of themselves as being sick. So how am I going to prove that something is good? Immediately now, Mill substitutes the word desirable for the word good. And I think that's a legitimate substitution, that these are synonyms. If something is good, it's desirable. If it's desirable, it's good. So how am I going to prove that something is good? How am I going to prove that something is desirable? Now Mill makes a comparison. Well, how do I prove that an object is visible? It must have been seen. It would be ridiculous to have a theory of visible objects that no one has ever seen. How do I prove a sound is audible? It must have been heard. It would be ridiculous to have a theory of sounds that no one has ever heard. I remember being taught the great ancient astronomer Kepler thought that the planets made music as they moved around the sun. It struck me as being ridiculous. Nobody's ever heard the music. Why should anybody think that it's there? 
the only way to prove a sound is audible, it must have been heard, so the only way to prove that something is desirable, it must be desired. It would be ridiculous to have a theory of what is desirable if this was not, in fact, what people desire. Go see what people desire, best clue you'll get as to what's desirable. Find out what's been seen, best clue you can get as to what's visible, what's been heard, best clue you can get as to what's audible, what's been desired, best clue you can get as to what's desirable. And Mill thinks now everybody in all times and places has always desired happiness. This now does seem to be unanimous. Everyone wants happiness, each in their own way, sometimes unique or even peculiar. A hypochondriac finds happiness in thinking of themselves as being sick. A masochist finds happiness in having pain inflicted on their body, usually in some proper way and circumstance. A martyr, our suicide bombers, they find happiness in dying for the cause. Everybody has always wanted happiness. And so Mill proposes as the basis of ethics what he calls the greatest happiness principle. If you want to know if something is right or wrong before you do it, you ask yourself, if I do this, will it make on balance for greater happiness or will it make on balance for greater unhappiness? Like taking a piece of paper, dividing it, down the middle, happiness on one side, unhappiness on the other side, make up a kind of moral ledger. This is sometimes called the accountant's morality, which outweighs the other. Happiness on the one side, unhappiness on the other side. You ask yourself, if I do this, how many people will get how much happiness? On the other hand, if I do this, how many people will get how much unhappiness? So it isn't just the amount of people, it's not just democracy here where everybody counts for one and the same, no more and no less. Here the intensity of the happiness or unhappiness that each person feels should be factored into the equation as well. You might be thinking of doing something that will make ten people happy, one person unhappy. Seems like the balance is on the side of happiness ten to one, but maybe those ten people are getting only a very small amount of happiness, you know, taking a slave or bullying somebody. Those ten people will get some happiness from the slave or some happiness from doing the bullying, but the one person who is enslaved or the one person who is bullied, they suffer much, much more unhappiness, much greater depth of unhappiness. And so in this example, the way I've tried to present it, the balance is on the side of unhappiness. If that's the way it calculates out to the side of unhappiness, that's called bad or wrong. It's bad to make people unhappy. They don't want to be unhappy. If you made them unhappy, that was the wrong thing to do. If it calculates out to the side of happiness, that's called good or right. It's good to make people happy. People want to be happy. That was the right thing to do with them. And if you want to know what happiness is, and of course everybody would, happiness is defined as pleasure and no pain. Unhappiness, logic students, will be defined as pain and no pleasure. So this turns out to be the highest good in life, the foundation of morality, pursue pleasure. Go home, tell your parents that your philosophy teacher was arguing that the highest good in life and the foundation of morality is the pursuit of pleasure. I always imagine they would call me up to complain if they don't actually come to campus to bang on my door, because what would they be taking me to be advising you to be doing? Getting smashed on intoxicants, pursuing animalistic sex. I will reply to your parents why that's not what I meant when I told your kid to pursue pleasure. What did I mean when I told your kid to pursue pleasure? Clue, of course, I'm a philosophy professor, and so I meant, you know, read great works of literature, study human history, what has gone on between human beings among the ages, art, music, philosophy. That's what I meant when I told your kid to pursue pleasure. Parents will probably respond to me, well, that sounds very nice, professor, but you obviously don't know very 
very much about your students, Professor, because your students are kids. When they go out to pursue pleasure, they do not pursue what Mill calls the higher pleasures, the uniquely human pleasures, the intellectual or spiritual pleasures. You can tell that that's true because on college campuses all across the country, the library on weekends is not only empty, generally it's closed. It's a waste of time to keep it open. It's a waste of electricity to keep it open. Philosophy club discussions, poetry readings on campuses of 35,000 students, maybe a dozen people go. On the other hand, the bars that serve college campuses pack to capacity. People waiting on long lines outside with their meticulously purchased fake IDs, willing to pay money, willing to pay a cover charge just to get inside to get smashed on intoxicants and maybe get lucky, get some animalistic sex. How do I reply to your parents? Oh, really? Why did you raise your kid this way? I tell your kid to pursue pleasure, and the only pleasures you think your kid will be capable of pursuing are the animalistic pleasures. You see your kid as being nothing more than an animal. I see your kid as being, well, an animal, I suppose. Maybe we're animals. See the evolution lecture. But human beings are more than just animals. We are human beings capable of intellectual and spiritual pleasures. No animal is capable of. Parents will probably reply again. Sounds very nice, Professor, but doesn't match any reality that we know of. Yet Mill replies, one of my favorite sentences from Utilitarianism, it is the pleasures of the intellect of the feelings and imagination and of the moral sentiments, these get a much greater value as pleasure are more pleasurable than the pleasures of what he calls mere sensation. And so it's from that passage that I took the title of the lecture, Philosophy is More Pleasurable Than Sex, Pleasures of the Intellect. I just take as the ultimate pleasure of the intellect, philosophy, discovering what is really, you know, reality, discovering what is really going on in the world around you. And I take as the ultimate pleasure of mere sensation, the pleasures of a good screaming orgasm. Although, since I also gave this lecture at a Catholic university, and I like to use examples that all of my students can relate to personally, for those I would substitute what to my experience in life is the second most intense pleasure of mere sensation, and that would be the pleasure of eating Ben and Jerry's ice cream especially Chunky Monkey. But note, it is not just a philosophy is more pleasurable than sex lecture. It is also the pleasures of the intellect, the pleasures of the feelings and imagination. Feelings, that which is aroused by great poetry, any fans of great poetry, that which is aroused by great literature, the feelings and imagination, great art, great music, any fans of great art, any fans of great music, and of the moral sentiments of being a good person, feeling better inside. These are all much more pleasurable than the pleasures of mere sensation, a good screaming orgasm, or Ben and Jerry's ice cream. But it isn't obvious, again, how he can make this claim, since he says if you want to know what's desirable, see what people desire, and as I have already pointed out, people hardly desire the higher pleasures. Libraries are empty or closed, poetry readings or philosophy club discussions. Nobody grows. They overwhelmingly desire the lower pleasures, bars packed to capacity, long lines, smashed on intoxicants, animalistic sex. In the face of that, he says if you want to know what's desirable, see what people desire. They over overwhelmingly desire the lower, they hardly desire the higher, how is he going to argue that still the higher pleasures are superior? His argument, very brief and beautiful, few humans, note he says, few humans would consent to be a lower animal even if they were promised the maximum amount of the animalistic pleasures, and that's the whole argument in a nutshell right there. But he does go on very significantly, as I will show, and says no intelligent person would consent to be a fool. Note he has changed from few to none. No intelligent person would consent to be a fool. No educated person would consent to be ignorant. No good person would be selfish or base, even if they were promised the fullest 
allowance of the satisfaction of all the desires they have in common. Of course, what intelligent people have in common with foolish people. Everybody enjoys the pleasures of food. Everybody enjoys the pleasures of sex. But even if you got all the food and sex, still, no intelligent person would consent to be a fool. And so he's creating a kind of thought experiment here for you. Ask yourself, which would you rather be? A human with a human brain, but the minimum amount of the animalistic pleasures, or an animal with an animal brain and the maximum amount of the animalistic pleasures? Which would you rather be? A poor person living in the slums, or Rockefeller's dog? Rockefeller's dog gets to live in an air-conditioned, climate-controlled doghouse. Rockefeller's dog gets to sleep on thick, plush carpeting. Rockefeller's dog gets to eat table scraps from the Rockefeller family table. New York steak and oysters Rockefeller. Well, my poor person living in the slums, they can't afford to pay the rates they charge for electricity. They won't have air conditioning. They'll be hot and sweaty in the summer, shivering and cold in the winter. And the poor person doesn't get to sleep on anything thick and plush. They will sleep on a torn up old mattress on the floor, maybe on the floor itself, and the poor person doesn't get to eat anything delicious like New York Steak and Oysters Rockefeller. They eat macaroni and cheese out of a box, that 50, 60 cent a box stuff. Yuck, I hate that stuff. Even that's during good times at the end of the month when the food stamps run out. You'll find them rummaging through the dumpsters behind McDonald's, Burger King, if they get really desperate, even Jack in the Box, E. coli, here I come. And to complete the example, since I had the dog eating people food. I should have the poor people eating what I am told poor people have sometimes had to eat dog food, and for the maximum amount of the animalistic pleasures, and since to my knowledge dogs do not enjoy the pleasures of intoxication, but I bet most of you do, and so stretch your imagination, you're a combination animal now, Rockefeller's dog slash cat and Rockefeller will scour the world over to find you only the most exotic and potent forms of catnip so you can get the best high that any cat could ever want. While my poor person living in the slums, they never get to get high on any high-quality intoxicant. Maybe occasionally they find a half-empty bottle of some cheap wine in some passed-out bum's hand. That's the only intoxication they ever get to enjoy in life, and for the maximum amount of the animalistic pleasures, Rockefeller's dog slash cat slash prized stud race horse. The prize stud racehorse gets to have all the sex that it can handle, and only with the most attractive and fit members of the opposite sex. While my poor person living in the slums, they never get to have sex with very many people at all. Only the floor to do it on. Breath that stinks of dog food, you would think would be pretty repulsive to just about everybody. Which would you rather be? And note again what he said. Few humans would consent to the change. He's not totally out of touch with the reality around here. Oh, nobody would ever want to change, he realizes there might be a few of you listening to me right now thinking, yeah, make me the prize stud racehorse, bring on those mares, better than anything I've been getting around here lately anyway. But as far as Miller's concerned, that would be only a relatively few of you. And the reason you would rather be the human with the minimum rather than the animal with the maximum must have nothing to do with any alleged superiority of the human ability to enjoy the pleasures of the senses, the taste of food, of the pleasures of sex. In other words, you're not thinking to yourself, yes, the prize stud racehorse may get to have 50,000 orgasms in its glorious life. I will only have five orgasms in my deprived and miserable life. But you already said, Steve, it's not just the number, it's intensity counts also. You might think to yourself, yes, the horse gets 50,000 orgasms, but the horse's orgasm is so relatively mediocre and plain. I will get five human orgasms, which are so intense, satisfying, and spectacular. You might think ultimately you'll get more pleasure from five really spectacular human orgasms than the horse will get from 50,000 mediocre horse's orgasms. Don't assume that. You've never had a horse's orgasm. How would you know? Assume, for purposes of argument, the horse's orgasm is just as intense for it as yours are for you, and it gets 50,000 and you only get five. Now that I have explained it in terms of mathematical precision, does that make you change your mind? Oh, of course, I see now. Steve, make me the prize stud racehorse. Bring on those mares. For Mill, these considerations are completely irrelevant. The reason you would rather be the human with the minimum rather than the animal with the maximum 
has nothing to do with any alleged superiority of the human ability to enjoy the pleasures of the senses, the taste of food, or the pleasures of sex, even if it's true that we do enjoy these pleasures more. Student pointed out to me, Professor, the human tongue has more taste buds on it than an animal tongue. Still, that would be irrelevant. The reason you would rather be the human with the minimum rather than the animal with the maximum has only to do with the superiority superiority of the human level of consciousness. Human beings just appreciate their world so much more than animals do in every way. That's what gives human beings the greatest pleasure, which I will show now by changing the example just a little bit. Which would you rather be? A human parent bringing up your children in the deprived circumstances that I just described, or the animal parent bringing up its children in the luxury that I just described? The human parent knows it will have to watch its children sweat on hot summer days, shiver on cold winter days, occasionally have to watch your children be hungry, while the animal parent knows, as far as animals can know anything, its kids will always be cool in the summer, warm in the winter well-fed and have the best of everything. Still, you would rather be a human parent even if you have to watch your children suffer because of the way human parents appreciate the lives of their children. Human parents get the greatest pleasure, do they not? I know this was true of my parents and I bet it was true of yours also. Remembering what they all can remember and love to remember? What a cute little kid you were when you said your first word and took your first step. I remember, by the way, as I was growing up, my parents had a pair of bronzed baby shoes on the mantel in the back room. They were my first pair of shoes. Got them bronze so they could always look at it and remember what cute little feet I had. The parent can remember, loves to remember just about every step its child has taken from its first step to its present. The human parent wants to know about everything going on in its child's life today. What courses are you taking? Are you learning anything interesting and important? What's your major? What are your career plans? Your social life? And your parents look forward to your future with that peculiar and inimitable human quality even poor people can have when they look forward to their child's future. I'm talking about the quality of hope. I hope my kid's life won't be as tough as mine was. I hope my kid's life will be easier than mine was. Animals, apologies to the animal rights people, the way we usually think of animals, they don't do anything anything like this. The dog doesn't dwell like your parents do. Oh, how cute my puppy was when it said its first bow wow. The dog doesn't remember with anything like the degree of completeness with which your parents can remember every step its puppy has taken from its first step to its present. The dog doesn't appreciate the present life of its puppy to anything like the degree of complexity with which your parents appreciate what's going on in your life. And the dog doesn't look forward to its puppy's future with anything like the hope that your parents have for your future. This is what gives human beings the greatest pleasure, remembering the past, your first words, your first step, how the past has become the present, every step you have taken since, what's going on in your life today, how was your day, looking forward to your future with hope. And so it is not correct to say that ignorance is bliss, I have just disproved that very unphilosophical saying. Instead, I have proved the opposite. It's not ignorance that is bliss. It is consciousness that is bliss. It is awareness that is bliss. And the more consciousness, the more awareness, the more bliss. Just like with your parents, if they suddenly come across a bunch of pictures of you, it's been lost for a while, you're doing something cute, more consciousness, more awareness, more bliss. And so I have always liked to choose as an ally for John Stuart Mill. In our world today, Ziggy Marley, son of the great immortal reggae legend Bob Marley, Ziggy's first and greatest album. How often is their first one their greatest one? The very appropriately titled Conscious Party album. And the very first lyric on the very first song on the very first CD ever released by Ziggy Son of Bob, he sings, This is your official invitation to the conscious party. This is your official invitation to the conscious party. Ziggy Marley knows, as John Stuart Mill also knew, the best type of party to have 
is a conscious party as contrasted with the drunk and unconscious parties so many college campuses so much of America is so very famous for. But if this argument has any shred of a ring of truth to it, and to my mind it certainly does, it's overwhelmingly powerful, we come back now to our original problem. How come people overwhelmingly choose what is of lesser value, the lower pleasures, and hardly choose what is of greater value, the higher pleasures? And I don't want you to think you're hearing me say that the lower pleasures aren't pleasurable. For some reason, through the course of my career, I had so many people think I was saying, maybe it's just because I'm a philosophy professor and this is what they expected me to say, oh no, the lower pleasures, they're no good, they're no good, stay away from them, just pursue the higher pleasures. Hey, I'm calling the lower pleasures pleasures, are and I. I hope it's obvious. Nobody is arguing eating delicious food isn't a great pleasure. Obviously, it is a great pleasure. Nobody is arguing that a good screaming orgasm isn't a great pleasure. It is a great pleasure, but it's not as great a pleasure as you would rather be the human with the minimum rather than the animal with the maximum. So how does Mill explain most people making the wrong choice? By pointing out, not everybody has the right to choose. If you have to choose between two things, higher and lower, helps to know both sides. If I say, at San Diego State, which is a better beer, Budweiser or Bex, or at USD, which is a better ice cream, Springfield or Ben & Jerry's, San Diego State, they invite me to beer blasts, USD, they invite me to ice cream socials, that's the truth. You try Budweiser, you try Bex, you try Springfield, you try Ben & Jerry's, you will see Bex is much better than Budweiser. In my experience, friends do, let fr do not let friends drink Budweiser, and Ben & Jerry's is much better than Springfield, although you yourself don't have have to try them both. You can ask people, after all, if I said to you not which is better but which is a worse addiction, alcohol addiction or cocaine addiction. To answer that question, you don't have to get addicted to alcohol, then get addicted to cocaine, and then you'll find out. Ask people who've been addicted to both. I've had such people in my classes, you know, come up to me after. Professor, I rebelled against my parents in my youth, got addicted to alcohol and cocaine and all kinds of drugs. My parents caught me, forced me into rehab. Now I'm back in college trying to get my life on track. And if I had, say, ten such students tell me that, and I asked the ten of them which was a worse addiction, which was a harder addiction, alcohol or cocaine, and all of them, or almost all of them, told me one was worse than the other, best evidence I can gather to enable me to conclude the same way myself. And Mill thinks if you ask people who've experienced both the higher and the lower, all of them will choose the higher. None of them will choose the lower. That's why he abandoned his caution in that passage where I praised his realism. Few would consent to be the animal, even if they were promised the maximum amount of the animalistic pleasures. He abandoned his caution. It became no intelligent person would consent to be a fool. No educated person would be ignorant. No good person would be selfish. This is why he changed from few to none, because in those latter examples, the person in question does know both sides. Do intelligent people know what it's like to be foolish? Everyone is foolish from time to time. I think I can remember at least one occasion when I was foolish. Do educated people know what it's like to be ignorant? Everyone is ignorant before they get their education. Do good people know what it's like to be selfish? Everyone is selfish. That's part of what we mean by being good, overcoming your selfish urge and doing the right thing anyway. So if you know both the higher and the lower, everyone will choose the higher. No one will choose the lower. So who are these few who would want to be the lower animal? What must their lives be like? They must have never had an education, cultivated the spark of human intellect that dwells within everyone, and if in addition, starting from early childhood, their life has been one continuous round of working at jobs that are boring, backbreaking, monotonous labor, if that's what your life was like, never sent you to school, never taught you to think, work you like an animal 
available all the time, then the prize stud racehorse might look good to you. But to anyone who has ever had an education, cultivated the spark of human intellect that dwells within everyone, no intelligent person would be a fool, no educated person would be ignorant. So the theme becomes, of course, the theme of education. People choose the lower because they don't know the higher. If they knew the higher, they would choose them. They are uneducated. Strange conclusion for me to reach, though, since I was giving these lectures at university campuses, institutes of higher education. How can I claim it's a lack of education? These are institutes of higher education. Oh, but what kind of education is it? Hail the mighty Scantron. Anybody go to school not familiar with a Scantron? One person, me, never used one in my entire life. The main intellectual activity involved in preparing for Scantron exams? Do lots of memorizing, charts, tables, bold print, vocabulary words. Walk into the exam, try to match up what you memorize with what the question seems to be asking. Do it as best you can as soon as you walk out. Forget it. Make room for the next load of stuff you got to memorize and spit back. Forget that to make room for the next load of stuff you got to memorize and spit back. Doesn't teach anybody the joy of thinking, just a pain in the ass for you, and an easy way for a busy or lazy teacher to assign a grade. Modern education, a boring, stress filled, pain in the ass. I want that word for word in your papers. Boring, memorizing, stress filled, you're getting graded. All of my students have always known that. They certainly never let me forget. You're getting grades, you're being ranked next to the people around you. Generally speaking, they think their whole future is at stake. Get good grades, you'll have a good future. You're getting bad grades, you'll have a bad future. The people with good grades look down to the people with bad grades. They're stupid, they're lazy, they're no good. Difficult to enjoy yourself under those circumstances. Boring, stress-filled, pain in the ass. Let's go get drunk and forget about it as soon as we possibly can. But if you are well-educated, he tells us now more specifically what would be involved in a life fulfilled with the maximum amount of happiness. He writes, if by happiness be meant a continuity of highly pleasurable excitement, if by happiness you mean continuous orgasms, it is evident enough that this is impossible. A state of such exalted pleasure lasts only moments, or in some cases, and with some intermissions, hours or days, like on your honeymoon. This is the occasional brilliant flash of enjoyment not its permanent and steady flame. The happiness which I mean is not a life of rapture. You can't have a life of rapture, but you can have moments of such in an existence made up of few and transitory pains. Many and various pleasures make your pains few and transitory, few and short-lived. Be very careful, be very hesitant to go out and engage in extreme sports and smash up your body for the rest of your life. Probably the only body you'll be able to get. Make your pains few and short-lived. Your pleasures, he says, should be many and various. Enjoy all of life's pleasures, each in its proper measure, getting all of the benefits of indulgence, not suffering the defects of overindulgence, and with a decided predominance of the active over the passive, be active, don't be passive, don't watch other people play sports, go out and play sports yourself. Universities shouldn't be focused on a big intercollegiate athletic program where a few people play the game and everybody else sits on their behind and watches. Big intramural program, everybody go out and play sports. And don't sit on your behind watching other people live their lives on soap operas or reality shows. Go out, live your own life, make it as interesting as a soap opera or a reality show, decided predominance of the active over the passive, and having as the foundation of the whole 
this is the foundation of the whole and personally the part I myself have the most problem with. Not to expect more from life than it is capable of bestowing. Life is not going to be perfect. Don't expect more from life than it is capable of bestowing. My mother used to teach me when I was growing up, into every life a little rain must fall. Or sometimes she would say, life is not a bowl of cherries. Nowadays I hear people, shit happens. Don't expect more from life than it is capable of bestowing. A life thus composed, those who have been fortunate enough to obtain it, has always appeared worthy of the name of happiness, and such an existence is even now the lot of many during some considerable portions of their lives. It is the present wretched education, terrible education, wretched social arrangements. These are the only real hindrance to its being attainable by almost all. Wretched education, memorize and spit back and forget. Wretched social arrangements, work your life away at a meaningless job. And so what about people though, who can get a good education, rich people, to whatever extent a good education can be gotten, they can afford to get one, they don't have to work their lives away, they have leisure time, they can afford to enjoy all of life's pleasures. Mill tells us when people who are fortunate in their outward lot, when rich people, fortunate in their outward lot, rich people, <clears throat> when they are not happy, when they do not find in life sufficient enjoyment to make it valuable to them, the cause generally is caring for nobody but themselves. They are selfish. To those who have neither public nor private affections, the excitements of life are much curtailed. If you're selfish, only one thing you're interested in, yourself, after a while, that will get to wearing pretty thin. Have private affections, friends, and loved ones, people who you care about about as much as you care about yourself. The excitements of life are expanded, and public affections care about what's going on at your university, in your city, in your state, in your country. What in the world is going on around here? Have public affections. The excitements of life are much expanded. Next to selfishness, the principal cause which makes life unsatisfactory is want of mental cultivation, bad education. A cultivated mind, I don't mean you have to be a philosophy professor, but any mind to which the fountains of knowledge have been opened, any mind to which the fountains of knowledge have been opened, and which has been taught in any tolerable degree to exercise its faculties, find sources of inexhaustible interest in all that surrounds you. If you have a good education, you will find sources of inexhaustible interest in all that surrounds you. You will never get Bored. That's me, by the way. I have so much interest in what's going on around me. I never get bored. And the first thing that he mentions, and this is one of the reasons I love Mill so much, not philosophy, the first thing he mentions, the objects of nature, natural beauty, Yosemite Valley. After natural beauty, beauty created by human beings, the achievements of art, the imaginations of poetry, the incidents of history, the ways of mankind past and present, and their prospects for the future. The ways of mankind past and present, their prospects for the future, just like the human parent gets the greatest pleasure from remembering their child's first words, their child's first step, so a cultivated mind like mine sees all of humanity as one big human family. After all, if you're religious, we're all God's children. You're not religious, you believe in evolution, we're all Lucy's children. 
Lucy, of course, the small little ape-like creature found in the old Vi Gorge by Mary and Louis Leakio a little bit more than a half a century ago, supposed to be the common ancestor to all human beings. Either way, we're one big human family, or <clears throat> all God's children, or we're one big monkey family. So just as the nuclear family, the human parent, gets the greatest pleasure from remembering their child's first step, a cultivated mind like mine, the human family's first step from the cave, out into the cradle of civilization. Think what a big step that was. Where would you be if they never took that step? You'd still be back in the cave and you wouldn't have your phone. Humans' first words. Your parents love to remember your first words. Linguistics. How do humans speak? Those words your parents love to remember every step you have taken from your first step to your present. My wave to my friends in the history department. Every step the human family has taken from its first step to its present. And I love human history. You've already seen in many of these other lectures a lot of history. In the family, by the way, my older brother Roger, a history professor, chairman of the history department at Washington State University, Pac-10 school up in Pullman for better than a decade. And I loved history and I was following in my brother's footsteps. I'd majored in history. I wanted to be a history professor. Professor also. Then I got to college and I took philosophy courses and I found that I thought philosophy was even more interesting than history. And this way I wouldn't have to be exactly like my older brother. And so I majored in philosophy and minored in history. And my brother majored in history and minored in philosophy. And so yes, we are very different. But in any case, again, history, every step the human family has taken from its first step to its present. And just like the human parent wants to know about everything going on in their kid's life today, how was your day? To a cultivated mind like mine, we're all one human family. Current events, what's going on with the human family? How was their day? Pretty much the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, put on the news, see what's going on with my human family all over the world. The human family, if you're following the news, very dysfunctional family fighting with each other, killing each other all over the world. I've had students come up to me and tell me, Professor, I'm from a dysfunctional family. They're still your family. You still have to love them. Well, if you say so, what do I know? But get the hell out of there as soon as you possibly can while you still have a shred of your own sanity left to live your own life. But how are you going to run away from your dysfunctional human family? They're just about everywhere. They're taking over everything. But maybe if we work on the problems confronting humanity, perhaps it's still possible to look to the human future with hope. I once had a student point out to me, Steve, you've already argued even parents bringing up their kids in the slums have hope for their kids' future. So if you follow the news and you realize what a poverty-filled, violent slum so much of this world is, maybe if we work on the problems confronting humanity, we can still have hope for the human future. And Mill writes again, Now there is absolutely no reason, absolutely no reason in the nature of things why an amount of mental culture, why an education good enough to give an intelligent interest in these objects of contemplation, art, poetry, anthropology, music, history, current events, an amount of education good enough to make people intelligent citizens of the world in which they live. This should be the inheritance of everyone born in a civilized country. Part of his definition of a civilized country, everybody should be able to get an education good enough to give them an intelligent interest in the world around them. Absolutely nothing in the nature of things. I would have preferred he said absolutely nothing in the nature of people. Why everyone shouldn't be able to get a good enough education, make them interested in the world around them. The devil, you remember the devil 
lectures, replies, Oh yes, Mr. Mill and Mr. Schlesinger, there is something very much in the nature of things, in the nature of people, in the nature of your students that will prevent them from getting the good education you're trying to give them this semester. First, Mr. Mill, Mr. Schlesinger, your students are too stupid to understand the lectures. Second, Mr. Mill, Mr. Schlesinger, your students are too lazy to go home and write their papers and make sure they really have this stuff nailed down. Third, Mr. Mill and Schlesinger, your students are too short-sighted. They don't realize how rapidly the semester is passing and they're losing their rewrite opportunities. Mill and Schlesinger may reply, well, but maybe it's not human nature that's responsible. Maybe it's human nurture. Maybe it's something in the environment. After all, in order to put themselves through school nowadays, I am told many students have to work to put themselves through school. I'm not sure how they manage to work and go to school at the same time. When I was in school for most of my life, school is an endless task. You're never done with it. The Nazis put on the front of the concentration camp Auschwitz the very famous Arbeit macht frei. Work makes you free. My brother, the history professor, speaks German. Change that. Arbeit macht müde. Work makes you tired. Personally, I think that's much more true. And so students come into my class. They've been working. Maybe the graveyard shift. They're tired. How are you going to follow my concise, fast-paced, logical lectures if you're tired? I remember I had one student came to every class, sat in the corner with her head down, and she'd been working the night shift. Now, just because their heads are down and their eyes are closed, by the way, I tell myself that doesn't mean that their ears aren't open and they're listening to every every word that I say. If I'm wrong about that, I'd rather you didn't tell me. I'm better off not knowing. But I think she was sleeping through the entire class. She thought she would get credit just for showing up. Maybe that's what they did in high school. I failed her at the end. She was kind of angry at me. Showed up to class too tired. Couldn't follow the lectures. You come home from work doing a philosophy paper takes additional mental energy. People don't have the mental energy. They're tired. The only energy they have, plop themselves down on the couch, watch some sitcom, grab the remote. Maybe they have the energy to lift the glass of intoxicant from the table to their mouth and then of course the semester passes in an exhausted drunken haze. They've lost their opportunities. But I did easily give incompletes. They got mad at me at the end for this. Made you submit the incomplete form to the department chairman so they could limit the amount that people like me would do. Come back and do it again. I once had a student say, how could you get mad at a professor lets you do almost endless rewrites of his lectures in consultation with him and if somehow you manage to mess that up, gives you an incomplete and lets you come back and do it again. And so if people were well educated, everyone should be able to become an intelligent citizen, interested in what's going on in the world around them. We need to change the terrible system of education from memorizing and spitting back to recapitulating and understanding and change the social arrangement so college students don't have to work to put themselves through school. School should be free in the name of equal opportunity. Universities, public universities, you want to go to an expensive private university, I guess that's your business, but public universities, so they give equal opportunity to everyone, and so everyone can have the chance to take the one opportunity they will have to go to college, learn about what's going on in the world around them, learn about the higher pleasures Universities, public universities, should be free. Then people would have the time to focus on school. Mill writes in the end, people lose their high aspirations as they lose their intellectual tastes because they have not time or opportunity to indulge them. People busy working their lives away, they don't have the time. There aren't a lot of places around where you can go to interesting plays, especially for a reasonable price, interesting discussions. They have not time or opportunity. And they addict themselves to inferior pleasures. So many people you know addict themselves to inferior pleasures, not because they deliberately prefer them, but because these inferior pleasures are either the only ones to which they have access, lots of bars around in this neighborhood, the only ones to which they have access, or the only ones which they are any longer capable of enjoying. But if people had a good education, 
all sides of an issue, think for themselves, what I do in my papers, what's God's position, what's the devil's position, what's evolution's position, what do you think, what's the defense of the West, what I'm doing now, what's the criticism of the West, what do you think, people had a good education, time to go to school, focus on their assignments, Mill thinks this is essential to have good citizens in a civilized society. Thank <laughs> you.